you know what? It's a new year. I said I was going to do less music centric stuff when I rebranded, and I've been really bad about keeping up with that. I'll throw these guys a curveball this time. Maybe I can actually talk them into letting me make something that isn't just the same old same. <laughs> Alright, fuck it. If y'all are gonna force my hand, I'm activating my trap card. I mean, those other videos will happen at some point, but if y'all just insist, then okay. I'm gonna make you show reverence... ...to the Queen. Gaga. Musician, actress, philanthropist, fashion icon, cookie salesman. Mm. These fuckers are good as shit too. She hasn't been in the public eye for 15 years and she's accomplished what most acts take 30 to do. If anything, doing an I love this song on Lady freaking Gaga almost feels a little too um basic, doesn't it? I mean, surely, hopefully, you don't need me to tell you that Lady Gaga is queen fucking shit, right? And you sure as hell don't need me to tell you how good the fame is. Literally one of the greatest debut records in music history, across every genre. On the same plane as records like The Chronic, License to Ill, Nevermind, Gordon, which goddammit, yes, I still say deserves to be up there. I got shit for saying that. People, have you actually listened to this? It's charming, fuck you. But yeah, one of the best first impressions in pop and one of the albums that would cement her place in music history. And what helps make Gaga such a fantastic performer is just how she is ultra, super, mega, next level queer. Like, oh my freaking God, people. This record, and Lady Gaga in general, if I'm being honest, is like iced coffee, tank tops, oversized hoodies, and the best corners of TikTok. It was just made for the gays. This belongs to the Alphabet Mafia. This is ours, motherfucker. And with her bold as fuck music, her bizarre and striking look, her absolutely zero fucks given attitude, she was truly the original chaotic bisexual. Well, if we're being completely honest about it, the original chaotic bisexual. Radio. Everybody. All we hear. Radio Gaga. Actually, no, I can't even really say that. If we're being real, like realist of real about this, the true OG chaotic bisexual of the music world? Look, Kiss was full of shit. God didn't give rock and roll to you. The gays did. You're welcome, by the way. Nowadays though, while the raw music on the fame still holds up like crazy, uh, no joke, this record is just bangers across, bangers across, bangers. You know, even just doing the research for this, I couldn't stop spinning this goddamn record. It's so good. The overall image and shock value of this record, um, in hindsight, it feels weird to say, but it's almost quaint. By 2020 standards, at least, you know, something like this is practically kids bop compared to some of the tracks that get released these days. Do a kegel, run inside, spit in my mouth. But man, you gotta remember, in 2008, this record really was controversial. I mean, 2008 may not seem like it was that long ago, especially if you're old as balls like me. But man, people, you gotta remember, 2008 was a very different social landscape to today. We were still in the thick of George W. Bush's goddamn reign of terror. Gay marriage was still illegal in most states. DOMA and Don't Ask, Don't Tell were still in effect. Shit was still, like, 
pretty bad for LGBT people in the States. A lot of strides were made, no doubt, but it was still a dangerous time to be queer in America. You know, just like all the other times. It wasn't the 50s by any means, but we still did have a long way to go. And being so open and forceful about a sexuality that wasn't white hetero male, or at the very least, white hetero male friendly, still basically meant you could be dooming your potential mainstream success back then. And you could potentially survive and even thrive as a niche artist, but if you wanted to be the biggest thing on the planet, if you wanted to be a legit pop star, you pretty much had to at least present as straight. Not that LGBT superstars on that level weren't a thing at all, but more often than not, you at least had to establish some cred before you could ease the whole not a straight on people. Bowie had to write four of the best albums of the early 70s before he could come out. Elton John had to have Honky Chateau and Goodbye Yellow Brick Road under his belt before he felt comfortable enough to do it. Hell, people, even Freddy, goddamn Mercury, one of the most celebrated bisexual people in the entire wealth of modern music history, technically never officially came out at all. Yes, really, look it up, it's actually quite a sad story. People, I'm just saying, even in the late 2000s, laying all your cards on the table like that, pun not intended, when you weren't already a big established superstar was still a really big risk to take. There were maybe a few exceptions to this, but rule of thumb, you just couldn't start out with the gay stuff. Very few artists opened up about it on their first record. It was still basically considered career suicide. And then? Disco stick. Well, uh, okay, full transparency, I might be bluffing a teensy bit with this description. I mean, this record was certainly important to me. I mean, you know, you grow up your whole life in the middle of buttfuck Indiana thinking you've got no choice but to be a corn-fred, born and bred, good old Midwestern Baptist boy. And then you see a video like this and realize that you could be... an anime villain. <clears throat> but really, I mean, if I'm being honest, even I have to admit, that's a bit of a stretch to call this album, like, loud and proud about its queerness. I mean, it is now with the gift of hindsight, and yeah, even back then. I can't remember, but it's, all it's not like she was being particularly subtle, but I mean, really, if we want to talk about the important LGBT-centric album that she put out, I mean... Yeah, people, her follow-up and definite contender for a spot in a future Bad Album Covers video, Born This Way, was really the record that said fuck it and went completely off the chain with those things. I mean, look, the themes were definitely in there, but honestly, this record was gaga at her most basic and just raw hedonistic. There's honestly not a ton of stuff in here, from a lyrical and thematic perspective at least, that we weren't already seeing from other artists. I mean, her first single off of this record, Just Dance. How to turn my shirt inside out, and we're all getting host tonight. I mean, there's definitely some subtext in here, but like, I don't know, this isn't really a straight or a queer experience she's talking about here. This is just like, drunk. And hell, if we really wanted to, oh god, I am about to kick a beehive with this. But yeah, Katy Perry actually kind of beat her to the punch with her own queer-ish song, I Kissed a Girl, by about five months. Eh, more on that topic later. But Gaga's second single, Poker Face, definitely brought forth the biggest hints about her sexuality. So grab yourself a snack and let's play this hand out, shall we? Mm. Well, again, I say that, but a song like Poker Face, um, 
doesn't necessarily give me a ton of depth to work with. I mean, it's got some damn interesting stuff going on sonically. The synth work really stands out with those overtly dark, almost industrial adjacent undertones in the intro, contrasting super sharply against the more blaring metallic harmonies in the front of the mix. That's super cool. The beat is also a extremely simple, but very forceful and commanding. Again, it's that same 4-4 marching band style beat that I've discussed in other videos. That beat that just forces you to pay attention. We've got that going on again in this track, and Gaga's purposefully staccato vocal delivery almost acts like part of the percussion in and of itself. Those ma ma ma's <laughs> were actually taken from an artist, um, a lot of you TikTok kids may recognize these days. <laughs> yep, same artist. <laughs> It's a song with a lot of slamming power, a lot of repetitive force, and with just the slightest hint of, like, sinister darkness to it. So, I mean, yeah, absolute A-plus sex jam material. I mean, you can, you can practically feel the meat slapping on this one. But even then, for as good as the music is sonically... I mean, I wouldn't say it's like mind-boggling or anything. It's a solid enough late 2000s electro-pop club jammer. It's not particularly groundbreaking or anything, and even the lyrics... I wanna roll with him, a heart that we will be. Uh, yeah, it's mostly just card puns. I mean, hey, plenty of songs have been written comparing love and or sex to a card game. But even though I love this song, I, I, I don't know, real talk, it's no ace of spades. I wouldn't even say it's necessarily a shape of my heart. Oh, fuck off. Ten Summoner's Tales is good. Don't give me shit. But ugh, again, like just on the whole, if I'm being dead blunt honest about it, the song it's just really, really pretty dumb. It's a dumb song. It's a super duper dumb song. But that's not always a bad thing, people. I mean, yeah, it's dumb, but it's not really shooting to be anything else but dumb. It's not trying to be Radiohead or anything. It's trying to be a good club bop. And look, those don't need to be smart. In fact, if anything, I'd say smartness can be a negative attribute to this kind of music. I know how that sounds, and you know, me being Mr. Critic Man, I'm not supposed to say dumb music good actually, but I mean, you know, when I'm on the dance floor with some cute piece of action pressing their ass directly against my crotch, the last thing I want to fucking hear is existentialism if we call to bang bang Oh my god, shut the fuck up, Tom York! I'm not trying to hear it, man! Fuck up! God, I need the pandemic to end so badly. On the surface level, at least, there's just really not much to this track. It's got a sick, danceable beat, some very nice synth work, a great vocal performance, and lyrics that are... definitely dumb, but not too intrusive upon your good time or anything. I mean, what more is there to really say? Well, coming back to those lyrics, here's the thing about this track. If you don't want to think about it, great. It's still a fun-ass jam that gets your body moving. You don't have to think about it at all if you don't want to. But I am a YouTube dickhead who talks about music. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't overthink, overanalyze, and nitpick to an absolutely insufferable degree. Now would I? So. Let's take a deeper bite on this. While the song is very simple at its core, it is just deviously subversive. More subversive than I think you'd probably realize on a first listen. And there were certainly a lot of finer details that slipped beneath the cracks on its initial release. For example, did you know this song has a swear in it? A cuss? An actual full-blown curse? Yes, really. 
In fact, it's a very graphic swear in a very prominent place. It's not like a little mumble thing buried in the back of the mix or something that you have to like back mask to find or no, no bullshit like that. This is a dead center, clear as fucking day. Once you hear it, you can never unhear it kind of swear. People, it's right in the damn Chorus. Okay, how many of you didn't know that before today? Hands up. It's okay. N no shame, no judgment. How many of you didn't know that was a thing? Okay, those of you that didn't. Holy shit, isn't that crazy? How the hell did she do that? Here's the thing. You so weren't the only one to not catch it. You really weren't. When this song was first released, no one caught that. This song was all over the place in the late 2000s. Hell, if you listened to mainstream radio back in the day, there was a good chance you would have heard this song four to five times in any one day. All of those radio stations across the entire country, and none of them censored it. I probably heard this song a million times when it dropped, and I never once heard an edited cut on the radio until much, much later. The song was on the air for months before one radio station, KIIS in Los Angeles, actually picked it up and finally muted the line. For literal months though, until they did, almost every mainstream radio station in the country was playing ad nauseum. <laughs> People, queen shit. But hang on, the line itself, fuck her face? That's a bit confusing, isn't it? I mean, in the verses, and even in the first half of the chorus, she's clearly singing about a dude here. So the whole fuck her face, poker face kind of stuff. Oh my god. Oh my god. Poker face? Poker face? Poke her face? I just got that! I just got fucking... 13 years this song has existed. I just got that. I am an idiot. It's the shift in pronouns that catches you off guard in this song. Once the chorus actually kicks in, there are subtle allusions to this song having more going on and some very not subtle allusions. Like right there, that one is way less subtle. There is no denying what she's saying there. She has got me like nobody. Sh. You can very clearly hear that sh. We are clearly talking about girls now. See, I'm, I'm confused. I thought we were, you know, we were talking about disco stick. Well, those are your two smaller clues that something not so hetero is going on here. But by the time we hit the bridge, Gaga finally just hammer the full point home. I know I said earlier that this album has aged very well, but this is honestly one of those lines that kind of hasn't. Who calls it a muffin anymore? Does anyone still call it a muffin after all these years? Are there people out there still calling it a muffin in 2021? I haven't heard anyone call it a muffin since like... 30 Rock? But yeah, by this point, the real meaning of the song finally hits you. You get it. This isn't just another dumb sex jam, even though it totally is a dumb sex jam, but there's more going on here. This is really about that time-honored ritual that every girl, gay, and they has, at least at one point or another, had to act out or participate in the time-honored tradition of faking it. Yep, that's what this song is really about. 
bluffing. What, you thought this line was just some dumb random rhyme to help keep the beat going? No, 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 that's not what we're working with here. Okay, maybe that line about the glue gun is, but this song has a bit more intrigue to it than it initially lets on to, at least. In fact, the title of the song makes way more sense once you realize that fact. Yeah, it's yet again another doofy card pun, but like, think about it. What is a poker face? Like, literally. Webster's Dictionary defines it as an inscrutable face that reveals no hint of a person's thoughts or feelings. It's the face you make when you don't want people to know what's going on in your head. The exact reason you would put on a poker face is when you're faking your feelings. And believe me, a lot of us have had to fake way more than feeling. Take that thought with the gender swapping going on in the chorus, and it finally dawns on you. This is a song about a girl having sex with a guy, but wishing she was having sex with a woman. And this isn't me overreaching either. This isn't me trying to force my own interpretation onto the song or anything. On April 11th, 2009 at a Palm Springs show, Gaga actually confirmed that yes, that's exactly what the song is about. Later on in the year, she was actually interviewed by Barbara Walters. Bluffing with my muffin, I hope I'm allowed to say it. <laughs> so. And on top of addressing those really ugly rumors about her being intersex, not that there's anything wrong at all with being intersex, but a lot of that talk basically just uh, amounted to, <laughs> she looks like a dude. <laughs> there was that rumor where that, that you had a male appendage, that you were a herma hermaphrodite, and you, t you joked about it on the stage last night. Maybe I do. You have fun with it. Why the hell am I going to waste my time and give a press release about whether or not I have a penis? My fans don't care, and neither do I. You goddamn straights did not deserve this queen. But in that interview, she also finally publicly came out as bisexual. Again, this was a pretty big deal in 2009, especially given that Gaga was only a freshman entertainer at this point. Again, like I mentioned earlier, being so bold and open about queer sexuality was a genuinely scary risk to take. We were still in an era where that wasn't okay to do. I mean, sure, the greats could come out if they'd gotten to a point where doing that wouldn't touch their sheen, but if being LGBT was the very first thing people knew about you, you were kind of digging an early grave for your career. I mean, Clay Aiken came out earlier in 2008 and his career suffered a severe blowback. A few years earlier than that, Lance Bass came out and it pretty much put the final nail in his solo prospects. Hell, around a year or so after this record dropped, country star Shelley Wright would get bombarded by death threats for coming out to her audience. And she wasn't even a new kid on the block. She'd been active since 1994. But even that wasn't enough padding to get her audience behind her. This was still a big risk for Gaga to take. But it paid off, people. It helped cement to her audience that her music and her shows were a safe space for queer audiences. And that point was, again, further driven home by her follow-up, Born This Way. I mean, we joke about the cover, but this thing's main fucking goal, which it absolutely succeeded at, was to frighten away the straights. Yeah, mission accomplished. And again, to do this with her second single is just the ballsiest fucking thing, people. Your second single, when you're a new artist at least, can be crucially important. Even more so if your first song was a hit. This can be the moment where you get to prove whether or not you're a flash in the pan. And publicly coming out in your follow-up single, especially in an environment that was still pretty openly hostile to LGBT people and not yet really fully ready to push openly queer artists to the extent that they deserved, that just takes a whole other level of chutzpah, people. You either walk away from a decision like that, queen shit of fuck mountain, or as a complete fucking clownazoid. And not only did Gaga walk away from that as queen shit of fuck mountain, <laughs> 
She did it while looking like a complete clownazoid. Again, ma'am, you are going to have to stop dropping this. The poor simps are gonna chip their teeth chewing on it. And what makes it stand out so much more to me is that not only is it a subtle and sly nod to the queer experience, but it's also like a strangely proud and anthematic song in its own weird way. Uh, like not to the level that she would eventually rise to, but it's out there, it's frank, it's uncompromising. I mean, people. A song with that right in the chorus has got something to say to you. I just adore how real this song feels. This is a genuinely queer woman singing about a genuinely queer experience that most queer people have either experienced for themselves or can relate to in some fashion. It feels earnest, it feels uncompromising, it feels just genuine. Unlike... Oh, why am I kicking this beehive? Why am I kicking this beehive? Why am I kicking this beehive? I'm only gonna regret kicking this goddamn beehive. I mean, y'all, I don't wanna come down too hard on Katie for this, but this track from the exact same year, it just, you know... Oh, people, it's got some problems. For one, Katie wasn't coming out with this song. This was written more with the intention to be like, a pseudo-edgy tease track to help establish her image as that pop starlet who was a little bit edgy, you know? That was like her thing really early on in her career. I mean, her debut is called One of the Boys. This is also the album with You're So Gay on it, a track that is, um... You're so gay and you don't even like boys. Way less respectable to the LGBT community. I mean, I've heard from people who say that I Kissed a Girl did help with their own discovery, and you know, I'm not trying to invalidate anyone's experiences here, but like, this isn't Tegan and Sarah, this is Skinamax, you know? It's a gay experience that's aimed pretty squarely at a straight audience, you know? It just feels hokey and chintzy. Yeah, yeah, that's part of Katie's aesthetic, blah, blah, blah. That's a much deeper conversation I don't really have time to have here. But I don't know, y'all. Time has not been nearly as kind to this one as it has to Poker Face. Add the fact that this song was partially written by Dr. Freaking Luke and just... Man, there's just so much ick attached to this song. I'm sorry, there is. Again, I'm not trying to drag Katy Perry here. She actually would later come out as bi herself and admit that while she was writing that song, she actually came under a fair amount of pressure from various industry creepazoids to put on a straight face for the sake of her image. Can't imagine how that would have happened. But even for Katie, it took a lot of time and a lot of success before she felt comfortable enough to go truly public with her true self. Gaga, on the other hand, she just busted right out the gates with it. Full-blown tiger shit, just rawr. This was one of the first steps she took and she just hammered her queerness home harder and harder with every advancement she made. A move that I'm almost positive people probably begged her not to do at first. But not only did she come out the other side, she came out as one of the defining artists of the entire generation. And in doing so, helped pave the way for other artists to open up and be frank about themselves. These days, coming out publicly isn't nearly the gargantuan, guaranteed career suicide move that it was 10 to 20 years ago. Queer artists can be more open and frank about who they are, and as a result, we've gotten many fantastic new strides across nearly every genre. And while LGBT artists can still definitely run into trouble when they do come out, it's still not a perfect world by any means. Oh, for fuck's sake, why do you idiots keep giving this asshole a mic? It is much less of an issue to be a queer performer, certainly than it was a decade ago. 
and I feel like we are vastly, vastly richer for the experience. We still have a long way to go, make no doubt, especially when it comes to trans, non-binary, and queer artists of color in the industry. For sure, we still got... It's a long road to walk, people, I get it. But we've been able to make a lot of significant strides, and Lady Gaga, with her brazen image, her unending confidence, and her glorious muffin, definitely played an important part in helping make that happen. There ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm Crash Thompson, and I'll see y'all in the next video. Mama, mama.